Brittany, welcome to the show. Uh, show. Uh, it's so good to have you. Thank you for making the time. Uh, for all of those who don't know you, and if people don't know you, then uh, they're fools. But uh, for those of you, of the, uh, the people out there who don't know you, who are you? Who, who am I? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> um, I guess I am Brittany Muller. I am Moz's senior SEO scientist. And before I was at Moz, I started a boutique medical marketing agency in Denver, Colorado, uh, and had so much fun um, building that out over the course of like five, around five years. Um, and then before that, I was just kind of getting into the weeds with the SEO stuff and becoming addicted to this digital game that we play every day, trying to get things ranked on search. It's so much fun. <laughs> Yeah, and then you became a, a rock star, um, which is awesome. But that's an awesome segue with um, the digital game that we play, because uh, you told me that you have a chess story. Uh, <laughs> what was that about? This is actually so embarrassing. So um, I have loved chess for a very long time. I think it's the most beautiful game. I, it relaxes me. I play all the time on chess.com. But I have sort of hit this like classic plateau And in order to get better, I realized, you know, I would love to have a, a teacher or an instructor once a week, you know, maybe once every other week. And so I found this company that does just that. And I had my first chess lesson yesterday. Kevin, you're going to die. He is so sweet. I think don't think he's old enough to drink and he was we're video chatting and he's in his college dorm room and there's like four frisbees on the wall and i was just like oh my god what have i done <laughs> he was so sweet that's it was so really cute. fun yeah so that's my new chess instructor so he's showing me the ropes it's really cool and is he like uh is he like a, a brainiac like is he totally killing it yeah he's just The way he's already started teaching me about shifting the way that I think about uh, piece play into positional play and seeing the board better. I mean, it's already so awesome. I love it. How does it make you feel, honestly? I know. It makes me excited. I need stuff like that yeah. to, you know, continue to sort of learn and dabble in. Otherwise, I just get bored. And I'm sort of an all or nothing person. Like, I, if I'm going to master something, I really want to master it. That's, you know, kind of my a curse and a blessing at the same time, I guess. Oh, I, I totally understand you. I, I can so relate to that. Um, but yes, I also love learning. And I also believe that if you want to be successful in SEO, you kind of have to have that mentality. Because yeah. Google is changing so much. Uh, and there's so much going on. But I also love chess. And I'm definitely not good. So... Uh, you could easily beat me, I think. Um, We should totally play. Do you have a chess.com account? I have one for um, another site. What's it called? Chess.io or something like that. But I'm totally happy to set one up uh, on chess.com. It's free. It's super fun. You I'm totally should down. check it out. Yeah, and I love... I, I just... So I learned there's a deeper philosophy behind the game of chess. Yeah. And in comparison to poker as well. So Ooh. Yeah, it's it's... Yeah. It's like mind blowing. You know, it's, it's similar to the difference between math and statistics and how those are two different approaches to see the world. Totally. And uh, with chess and, and poker, and I learned this, by the way, from um, a book that's called Thinking in Bets. And I'm blanking on the author, but I'm reading it right now. Her name is Annie Duke, right? Annie Duke. Wow. Um, it's an amazing book. And she's this poker player. She's like, This is a crazy story about accidentally discovering poker or having to play to make a living and then becoming this world star. And she kind of writes about all the principles that she learns about poker. And long story short, she talks about how chess is basically more like math, right? Because you have a limited amount of outcomes and you could technically calculate the quality of every... Um, position or of every move like you have, a, you have a defined limited number of outcomes because you know all the options is basically where this is going and poker is the opposite uh poker is probabilistic it's more statistics because there's a chance that somebody has certain cards but you don't know because you can't see their cards so right. freaking love chess to train that kind of uh, mental skill of learning yeah. how to move parts within 
predefined limits or constraints, but then also want to play more poker uh, because that is a fascinating view in the world as well. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's a great book idea. I wish I came up with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so often you play chess, I mean, like daily? So I went through a phase where I was just obsessed. I mean, it becomes a problem, honestly. So I <laughs> enrolled in the United States Chess Association. I had like my card that I, I remember dropping it at a bar in Denver and this guy picked it up for me and was like, here you go. <laughs> Who are you? I would attend tournaments, but I wouldn't play in them. Um, I got really serious about like learning, you know, end games, openings, reading the Bobby Fisher teaches chess, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. I just became obsessed. Um, and then I kind of, you know, I didn't have anyone to really play with. And so um, I sort of, yeah, got burnt out of that for a while, but want to get back into it. Oh, and there's sure. actually, there's a, so there's a machine learning old school program here at the, it's called like the Museum of Computers or something in Seattle. And it's one of the original ones that was built to play a person in chess. And there's this book of photos. And if you beat the computer, you get your picture in it. Oh. And so I was sitting up there. This was a couple months ago. And I was, sorry, the lights go off. <laughs> no worries. Um, all good. <laughs> every time. Like, I know this is weird. No um, problem. They might come back on. Okay. Um, I can brighten this too. Hey, it's no but, problem at all. Okay. I was up there playing and the employees of the museum, they came up to me and they were like, do you play? And I was explaining that I play a little bit and I really want to get better. And they go, you know, we have young girls come in here all the time and they look at this and they look at this album and they are always asking like, why isn't there a girl in here? Why isn't there a girl? And my heart seriously just like Oh, exploded. I was like, I have to come back. I will be back. I'm going to be in there. I'm going to bring other women with me. Screw that. So that's kind of what motivated this new inception of Chess 2.0 for me. Oh, that is such a cool background yeah. story. And it is kind of sad that there are so uh, few women and girls in that book. But what a cool idea, man. That That's uh, awesome. That's worth so much. And you're actually setting me up for success here because... I love how you draw that bridge to machine learning because that would have been my next question. Like, how is chess and machine learning related? Ooh, it's uh, a great question. So they say that there are more possible games of chess than there are atoms in the universe. Oh. Like, it's, wow. it's an incredible how many games of chess could potentially be played with the number of moves. Um, and I think in that same headspace machine learning, you could create any sort of algorithm, you know, a million different ways f to solve the same thing, right? Yeah. To get the same end result. And the, the difference being like a, the data scientist behind a machine learning model and the person playing, obviously, but it's also kind of like the training data. So a training data as a person playing chess is my previous experience. It's my knowledge of the game and a machine learning model. It's, the literal training data that's going into this. So I think that's where they're sort of similar and could potentially, you know, look a little bit alike. Totally, totally. And yeah. I, I really love the documentary around AlphaGo. <gasps> it was so good. It is, oh my God. Why did So they, good. Why was it only two hours, honestly? I could have, there's so much fascinating stuff around this. Anyway, um, the, the actual question I wanted to ask is uh, how does it, like you're absolutely passionate about machine learning and about chess as well. And so what is it that has to be some sort of a, of a mental connection for you? And I'm curious about how, how, it's, how, it, how both of these things fascinate you so much. Is that because of the grand scale of possible outcomes and training data or is there something, is there something else? I think I have just always been super competitive. Mm. And almost to a fault, like I hate bowling because I'm so bad at it. And I know there's a very low probability of me winning. And so I, I choose not to play. And I, you know, I, I freak out about the gross shoes and you have to put your fingers in these holes on the balls and it's gross. And really, I'm just, you know, a coward and I don't want to lose and I want to win at everything. So I think 
And I don't know where that really came from. Maybe it's being the oldest sibling and having a younger brother, and we were just constantly in competition mm. with each other. Um, I don't know. I Competition motivates me so, so much, and I've always been just ridiculously curious oh, yeah. to a fault, you know, where I'm doing stupid stuff or asking, like, the really weird questions because I'm just, I don't know why my head went there, you know? I can um, so, so relate to that. Yeah. And I think those two things sort of make a, you know, a really solid perspective for anything like search, engine optimization, machine learning, chess, you name it. Yeah. And I think, so first of all, yes, I, I'm the exact same way. First, I think there, that's kind of the second important trade uh, as an SEO. You have to have that sort of kind of competitiveness. And there are many different ways to be competitive. Some are just competitive with themselves, which drives them to, to learn and then others, they just want to measure up against others. And then I think you and I were more of the people that if we don't see a, a way to win, we're just not going to play <laughs> in the no. exact same way. No, we are not. <laughs> I'm the exact same way. So, so I know people like you can challenge them on anything and they will chime in because they just want to beat you, yeah. right? But if you challenge me and I have never done this before, I don't care, right? But if it's something where I see a chance, oh, then I care very much and then I just want to win. Um, totally, so, totally. Yeah, I can so relate to that. And then, I mean, like you are so deep in the topic of machine learning. Um, what was one of the things that surprised you along what you learned so far? Oh my God, there's been so, I mean, every time I re kind of get into it, something always surprises me. Um, I think the initial, when I, so I think I had found out, like people were talking about machine learning and how you know, becoming a data scientist was going to be like the sexiest new position in the future and the most powerful and badass. And I was like, what is that? I want to learn about that. I want to be that. And so I remember going to GitHub because I thought that's where all the technical things were. And I did a search for data science. And I did tons of digging within repositories and different different accounts. And I discovered that Harvard CS109 data science course was on GitHub. And I don't think it was supposed to be public. Oh. And they would release lectures every Tuesday and Thursday. This was like six years ago. And so I followed along and it just blew my mind. And it gave me that new kind of like excitement that SEO gave me like six years before that, yeah. you know, where yeah. I sort of felt like I was mastering it. What else is there to learn? Like there's experiments I could do, but beyond that, I wasn't able to kind of feed on anything else. And so this gave me that fuel of, holy shit, there's this whole other world out there that is just taking this stuff to the next level. And so I just became obsessed with it. Obsessed. I mean, I would do the homework assignments. I didn't have a Harvard email address, but the TAs would answer my questions when I would send them questions on my, from my Gmail. Nice. Yeah. And so I like felt like I was a part of this thing and it was so much fun. I just, I obsessed over it. I couldn't wait for those classes to come out. Wow. My heart is shining because I love to learn. I love all of that <laughs> stuff. But what I'm, curious, what I'm wondering about is like, how do you deal with all the math and statistics? Oh, so hard. <laughs> Cause I'm not naturally gifted in math or statistics. Um, that's why I think the Harvard course was really, really good for me because it really broke it down in layman's terms, but it also provided insane, easy to understand examples mm -hmm. that unfortunately I, I don't feel like I got from things like Andrew Ning's course, which is an amazing course and you should definitely check it out. But, um, the intro that Harvard and I'm sure, you know, other, universities and places have uh it just was such a great easy introduction into the theories of it into you know bayes theorem and where that came from and what that means and here's an example and it just really allows you to sort of wrap your head around it i love that um yeah i'll certainly link to all of these courses in the show notes because i think ah with math and statistics such a fascinating topic and at the same time like i don't want to like give away the responsibility or I feel like this like the school system in Germany kind of really failed me on that one because it's actually fascinating but I hated it in school yeah. I kind of got better in university in college but then in college we had like 15 hours where we went from like 
the absolute like numbers to exponential functions in math, right? So there's no way to really relate to it. They just pound your head and try to survive on the test. But that's oh. when I got curious about it. So uh, I'll check that course out. It sounds amazing. You, you definitely should. And I would say that um, you don't need to know as much of the probability statistics and math behind it as you would think. So the the platforms that you build upon like TensorFlow and Keras and Anaconda and all these things that you build upon, they have all of that baked into them. So it's really a matter of having just a basic understanding and being able to evaluate things like the loss function and to see like how well it's doing. But you don't need to be proficient in the equations in and of themselves at gotcha. all. Gotcha. At all. Most, I would argue that most people doing machine learning have, they couldn't write out the function if you asked them to. <laughs> like, it, it is so confusing. And then if you did, they wouldn't be able to do it, you know, without programs. Sure, sure. I mean, you don't yeah. need to understand how camera works to take a picture. Um, right. But that, that sounds amazing. And so how do you apply, you're, you're, the, you're a senior data scientist at Moss, right? Um, mm -hmm. How do you apply machine learning to SEO in your work? Yeah. So lots of different ways. Um, and I have, and most of the time it fails, to be honest. That's um, fair. But, I mean, I've tried lots and lots of ways, starting with um, automatically generating meta descriptions. Uh, that was super fun and successful, and you can plug that into a really large website to get you most of the way there. Um, and then it can be everything from recommendation systems uh, right. kind of setting off flags of potential fraud. You know, we've looked into that. Um, and most recently, I have been exploring various types of machine learning to solve for categorizing keywords intent. Oh. And we've been doing that by looking at the SERPs themselves. Because quite frankly, we all know Google houses the world's information. They know what someone is looking for when they do a particular search. And so our idea was, okay, if we can evaluate the SERPs that we see, uh, could we categorize and be able to sort of paint a picture for our customers of what that acquisition funnel looks like, right? Yeah, and yeah. where are their opportunities and whatnot? So that has been my most recent baby and I'm so, so proud of it. It's been really fun. That is amazing. I love that. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of feel like that sounds like a smart idea. And uh, so, as senior data scientist at Moz, the way I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you do a lot of research to inform the creation of new tools and features, but you're also very out there at conferences and speaking about it. So, does that mean that if you see an opportunity for applying machine learning to identify an user intent at scale from the SERPs or SERP features. Um, so that then becomes a MOS feature. Is that how I can understand it? Exactly. Exactly. Oh, very cool. And I'm, yeah, and I do take the time, you know, either when I'm at conferences or just even online with our Twitter community to sort of keep a pulse on what people are interested in the current space of SEO, but also what problems could we potentially solve for mm. people? And so that's what I try to take back to the product. I love that job. That sounds amazing. That's uh, yeah, like all that's learning fun. and all. Uh, plus you're like a product evangelist and you're a product kind of, um, you do a lot of uh, research or kind of, um, kind of, what do you call it? Like customer market research and that kind of stuff. So uh, that's amazing. Um, and so you also recently tweeted, tweeted about uh, TFIDF and how, <laughs> see, like I, I'm on your side. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I love the dance. <laughs> no, actually, see, I, it's always easy to bash some of these concepts in SEO, but yeah. I think there's, I think it's a bit a quick shot to just say, oh, this is not applied anymore. It doesn't make sense. Like, yeah. I love how you basically said in that tweet that if we understand the principle behind it, that we can just learn from it of what it might be today. And I wholeheartedly agree to that, you know, I, I think. So John Mueller recently uh, also tw uh, tweeted that um, SEOs should think about just trying to build a search engine themselves to understand the principles better. And yeah. I also think that's a smart idea, but just looking at some of these older concepts like TF-IDF, 
absolutely smart. So can you explain uh, TF IDF and and what it's how you think it's still valuable, at least for SEOs to know nowadays? Yeah, I think it's incredibly valuable. And like I said in that tweet, it is honestly one of the very first things you will learn about when you begin exploring machine learning, data science, um, any sort of natural language processing or text understanding, like you have to know the basic principle of TF-IDF. So what it is in a nutshell is it's term frequency, inverse document frequency. And so it's this pretty basic formula that evaluates a particular term's frequency within one particular document compared to the corpus. For example, the word the would have lots of instances sort of signaling that it's less important or less unique to the particular document in question. And so what it allows you to do is it allows you to pull sort of the more unique topics, the more unique words and information from a particular document. And it allows you to do kind of large scale text analysis. Um, and it's incredibly important to play around with and just to have an awareness because you can use it for so many things in SEO. And it's, I think it's good to just to be able to talk, you know, be able to speak about it. Um, and it, parlays into all these other really beautiful things in terms of natural language processing, text generation, um, you name it. So yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a big fan. I, I totally agree. Um, and to be fair, I, whenever I've used TF IDF tools in the past, I saw a good outcome when I optimized content. I say that. I do acknowledge that Google probably doesn't use it anymore or maybe uses separation or, or you know, like a progression of it. But there's there is some underlying principle that some of these tools hit on the head. So yeah. I wouldn't, you know, it's again like I, I wouldn't take such an absolute stance on some of these things, especially when you yeah. see results, right? Like you always want to verify your assumptions in those regards. So um, and I think you know it, it kind of also is a beginning of an understanding of entities and how they might relate to each other, which is the hot shit at the moment in, in SEO. Yeah. Um, have you have you played around a little bit with uh, Google's um, natural language processing API by chance? I love it. I think it's so fascinating and more people need to know about it. Um, yeah, I'm a huge fan. I'm a really big fan of the categorization mm. and that they give you a confidence score. So my biggest thing is, okay, if you're trying really hard to rank for this term and you're sort of neck and neck with another website, put your content into their natural language API and then, you know, put the other content in and compare how Google's categorizing you and your competitor. And oftentimes I see that the person trying to rank higher sees that their categories are diluted across maybe like three or four, where the competitor has one solid confidence score for a very specific industry. So I think, yeah, it's an incredibly powerful tool and not enough people know about it. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, I really yeah. like it as well. I think it can be, it's probably not yet ready to just sort of tell you what's going on. I think you still need to apply a lot of context and critical thinking to what the data tells you, especially, yep. you know, like what means uh, salience and how do the different types of entities compare um, because sometimes you'll see the same entities popping up in different categories, but still like just looking at that and getting an understanding of how that, you know, how you can um, think about entities at, as a, as a grand scheme, I think is so very, so very helpful. And it's, you know, I think it's, it's a good explanation for lots of things. Um, my personal theory is that that's why um, author rank or rel author kind of went away because they Google didn't need it anymore because now they know that people are entities and they can understand the relationship. So why would they, you know, so if you look, if you plug your stuff into that API, you can find a lot of these things. Totally. That's such a good point. Yeah. Yeah. That's a conspiracy theory. So I love it. <laughs> uh, gotta be careful it's with it. Dangerous that. too. It's dangerous to say that, you know, one particular, one particular algorithm or, you know, thing of a, of a space isn't applicable anymore. Mm. I mean, we, we live in this tiny, tiny bubble. <laughs> there is a huge, huge world out there using all of these incredible tools, algorithms, technology that we haven't even begun to explore. Right. So I think it's just dangerous to put labels on different things. And I mean, I 
try to second guess myself as well, like as frequently as possible about this stuff, because you have to be testing, you have to be exploring. There's just so much more out there than we make assumptions about. Oh, preach, 100%. Yeah. And has the, the journey of um, machine learning taken you also into areas outside of SEO? Was there something that you found along the way that you just got stuck in and went down the rabbit hole and now you're also passionate about, I don't know, machine learning in logistics? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. I mean, not logistics, yeah, mm. but um, <laughs> the machine learning world, I think that's exactly what it does, right? Like, I want to hear what you would fall into if you started getting deeper into the world of machine learning, because I think for every individual person, what you tend to do is you tend to think, well, what do I have domain knowledge in? You know, what what background or just kind of fundamental awareness could I leverage to solve for in a particular space. So once you start to learn the foundations of machine learning, you start to understand what's possible and what's not possible. And that's where your sort of your interests and your passions come into play. And something that I've been thinking about for years is applying machine learning to um, illegal poaching of animals and elephants in particular, because they are the best and I <laughs> love them so much. Um, <laughs> and uh, I just think there's so much potential in this technology to do really beautiful things. And there was a relatively like secretive project, with that, which I'm pretty confident they're speaking about now at Google, where they would take old cell phones and put them in these weatherproof boxes way up high in the rainforest to detect illegal deforestation using machine learning wow. to identify the sounds, right? And so th taking that same idea and that same principle, I thought, well, why isn't anyone doing this for, you know, poaching or for animals or crime for that? You know, it could apply to so many things. And it was funny because I um, became obsessed with the projects that Intellectual Ventures were working on, and they're just across, you know, the water in Bellevue here. And I reached out to Pablo Holman, who works on all these really incredible projects. And he informed me that Paul Allen, before he passed, started getting really into elephants. Mm. And he developed the same theory. And he started creating drones that were powered from the ground so they could stay up there for a super long time. And the drones, I believe, they're using high-definition cameras to identify poachers. God. Uh, and his sister is taking over that project. So there's these incredible wow. things that are going on in our world that like are as an <clears throat> SEO space, like we don't, we have blinders and I would encourage everyone to explore this stuff. It is so exciting and you can apply different aspects of all of these spaces to what we do every day, you know? That is so, so cool. Fun. It's so fun. That is such a cool project. Oh, I just love the way that it's thought through. Uh, that is amazing. What what got you so passionate about elephants? Where does that come from? It's clear that it's your spirit animal, uh, know, but that's a story. Know. I know. I honestly, I have no idea. I just, I've always just sort of loved them. I know they're super smart and they just seem so wise and adorable and human-like. And I don't know. I just want to live among them so bad. It's crazy. <laughs> have you seen that movie Dumbo? Yeah. Was it? According to expectations, I haven't seen. I've saw the old Dumbo like ages ago. Oh, is there okay. a new one? I think there is a new one. Just recently came out with a pretty good celebrity lineup. Uh, I think it's it might be worth checking out. Uh, and then in Germany, where I grew up, um, there is this um, this kids show uh, called Benjamin Blümchen. Uh, it means Benjamin Flowers or something like that. I don't think they have this in the U.S., but it's just big elephant, <laughs> human elephant that goes gosh. on adventures. And it's like, so I, I was wondering, is there something in the US like that, that you got hooked on as a kid or? I think I always just thought they were cool. And then I started reading lots of books about them. Oh. And so they have the sixth sense. There's a book called The Elephant Whisper and the way that they interact with humans and bond with humans and know when people have died that they know. I mean, they, they have an awareness on a whole different level than humans. It is 
fascinating. You should totally check that book out. I should. So it sounds like oh they're God, super... I cried the whole time. Ugh. They're so in tune with humans. Um, they knew that this like very close human who like took care of them for a decade had passed and they migrated across this huge sanctuary. It had to have taken them like a day or two. They got to the house of his and they stood out there for 48 hours sort of mourning him. Wow. I know. Damn. Elephants. <laughs> know. So underestimated. I know. The better oh, humans. I know. They're wow. the best. Yeah. We don't deserve them. <laughs> we, don't, no, we just don't, <laughs> don't deserve, deserve elephants. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That is so fascinating. I, know, I, I realize I know nothing about elephants. Legitimately nothing. I think my level of knowledge is from the Jungle Book. Um, that's, that's what, what I know about elephants. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Um, that's, yeah, that's a big one. Um, so now I'm trying to cut a segue into <laughs> another topic. <laughs> kind of don't want to leave there necessarily. Um, but elephants are also, I think there's a, a link to a donation, um, project in your Twitter account. Um, yeah. Can you can you uh, tell me what it's what it's called real quick again so I can include in the show notes? Yeah, I know I made a Bitly link for it, didn't I? Let yes, yes, I think something elephants. Yeah, Bitly. Uh, it's just help dash the dash elephants. Awesome. Yeah, I'll add that to the uh, show notes so people. Yeah, can and donate. that's the guy. That's the animal whisperer guy. Oh, crazy! And yeah. so, like. Okay, so we talked about the machine learning project for um, for elements or a couple of those. <clears throat> Excuse me, and um, yeah, let's let's hope they're successful. And so, how do you how do you think how do you think that will or how do you think machine learning will impact how Google search will change over time? Like with the well, knowledge that you have, it's it's probably it's a very broad question, but I think of a deep understanding of what's possible with machine learning. So, what do you think people can expect? in the near future, maybe the next three years. You want to get really crazy? Please. Okay. I haven't talked about this to anyone really yet. Okay. Oh, so you're first. this is, yeah, this is crazy. Um, and I can't stop thinking about it. And I, it's been on my mind for at least a week and a half now. And I feel like we could talk this out. Awesome. So where I see some of the stuff going, a, obviously, search will just continue to get better. They're getting a rich understanding of the real world. They're going to rely less on digital signals. Um, but where I've started thinking a lot, bear with me, is the Google Vision API. Have you played with that? I have not. Oh my God, dude. So if you upload a picture. I uploaded this really old picture of me and uh, like a Roger that I had gotten from MozCon. And the Moz logo is so small. It's not even fully in the frame. And within the different um, sections of that API, there's a logo section and it identified Moz. Wow. It also identifies where else that photo has been, who it thinks is in the photo, what things are in the photo, it picks up emotion. And when you look at the source code of the JSON, it's looking at the corner of my eyes and my pupils. Jesus Christ. It's, yeah, no, so they're, so they're measuring all of that within a photo. Wow. Oh, and also take into consideration, Google Photos has been free storage-wise, space-wise for our photos ever since it came out, correct? Yeah. And now they, they're just going to start charging, I believe, like, with the new phone, with the new pixel. And my theory is like, oh, they've gotten enough data. You know, oh, they man. have enough of our data to evaluate some of these things. So they don't need to do this. They don't need to give it to us for free anymore. And what has been on my mind so intently is I, I had purchased and I have the new Google home with the camera and the screen. And it has gesture detection so I will ask it to play something and I'll be in the kitchen and I'll sort I can go like this you know and it stops and then I go like this and it plays again and I'm standing there in front of the camera and I'm thinking holy shit you know I'm wearing like a lululemon zip up they know that they I'm reaching in my cupboard for kashi cereal they see that they see that logo I mean they will start to we will become the knowledge graph. 
God. in real time, in our own, we'll, we will own our own knowledge graph of preferences, products. Time, they know when I wake up. They know when I go to bed. You know what I mean? Like God. I started thinking about it, and I've had a really hard time adopting the product since then because I'm just, I'm constantly aware of the things they could be recording and using. Oh my God! They, this is Kevin, so crazy. Kevin, they can see what scares me. Like if if they're playing, if I go, "Hey Google, like good morning," and it plays the news for me, they can watch my eyes and detect. Oh, that made her upset. Oh, that really made her excited. They can start to just tweak and understand you better than you probably understand yourself. My God, this is insane, and it's so. Crazy that you mentioned that because I one of the four tabs that I have open is uh, for Google Lens, um, wow. and they have that stuff in there as well. So first of all, they're forging a a competitor to Pinterest, uh, where you can take a photo of something, it will tell you what items are in it, so you can shop for them. And this oh, is something, God. yeah, this is something where I think Google and Amazon will just fight to the death because traditionally Google yeah. has been pretty bad at this bottom funnel type of stuff, right? They're good at setting traffic, but bad at the conversion. And I think that might be a game changer. And thanks to all the people filling out the captures or clicking on the pictures to identify stuff and train Google's models. It is such a crazy idea that all we're doing is feeding Google. And we're basically, we're basically all hooked on drugs as SEOs. We're all Completely. hooked. Like, completely and we cannot we not you can't get off of it we can't there's so this like just this play just this the way that google set it up is an insane and i totally get what you're saying right like we'll just keep training this thing it will get feedback from us it works at scale so we'll learn really really quickly and the yeah. depth of what they can already do with the data is it's mind-blowing it's wild it is wild. I was thinking too, like they know what kind of wine I like to drink and how often probably if they're looking at that camera. And I mean, they can start to predict and surface all sorts of stuff for you very specifically. It's crazy. The, the, the big thing about it also is the ecosystem that they created because they will know when you write about this in Gmail to another person and how you think about that. They can even finish the sentences for you. God, they'll yeah. probably yeah. write the emails for you pretty soon. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you're not even be in there. So yeah. all of that is going to happen automatically. And then with all the other avenues where they have products in and integrations, I mean, look at maps. Look at the, they know where you are all the time. So no. when they add a vision to it, an actual eye to the system, then the brain is pretty much complete, right? I mean, like, okay, I'm talking like a crazy person right now. I, I hope everybody understands that I'm not, <laughs> you know, like I'm not expecting uh, Cybernet to launch tomorrow. No. Um, but if you spin that thought a bit further, it can get pretty crazy pretty fast. Absolutely. Where? So I'm just curious, where do you see SEO fitting into some of that in the future? Like with them having richer understanding of stuff. Yeah, I don't think it fits in at all, to be honest. Um, I have a really hard time to see an SEO play in that. And to, to bring it a bit closer to reality, okay? Like this is, like we're talking about what's possible. Mm -hmm. But I think what's real and how fast it's going to progress I think that's going to be much, much slower, right? And in much, much yeah. smaller increments and much more yeah. tangible. So SEO is not going to die tomorrow and it's probably also not going to die no. in the next couple of years. But in that future that we're painting right now, I don't think SEO has a very strong place. I think um, there will be less ways to optimize that system because it's it's not an answer. It's, it's, a, it's not a search system. It's not a pull idea. It's a push idea. You know what I mean? It will yeah. tell us stuff and suggest. And that's what we see, I think, already in the search results. It's less and less of search and it's more of predictive uh, answers that Google is trying to solve. And so I think that Google is trying to get to a point where, they didn't, where you don't need to search at all anymore. They're trying to get rid of search. And so um, with machine learning, it's perfectly possible because you know, when, as soon as a nervous system has a thought or a need, it will be detectable from some sort of a camera or from some sort of an action or an indicator or behavior. And as you said, it will probably know us better than we know ourselves. So why would we even search for something? And again, I'm going back and forth between some scenarios that are a bit more surrealistic and not given yet and some things that are more applicable nowadays. Uh, but I think emails are a great um, start where you already see uh, Google 
suggesting or f finishing your sentences, which is one thing, right? But I think very soon they'll be able to just take that data to the next level and just know how you're going to probably respond to that. Um, and again, I think there's so many different avenues that are now coming together, you know, like Gmail, Maps, and I'm probably forgetting five other things. There's Google Home, there's Google Search. There's all that kind of stuff. And I think they're capitalizing on that because machine learning allows them to. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a hard time visual visualizing search going away completely. I feel like there would still have to be aspects of you as an individual having really unique thoughts or questions or, you know, that would throw them off a bit. Um, but I also feel like Google is as close as we probably are to a general purpose machine that has general understanding of of things as we know it today. I just, my fear too, is that we will come up on another AI winter and this stuff is going to kind of not only not come to fruition, but um, be rolled back a bit until further funding supports it. I actually hope so. I think it would be healthy for the natural progression because some of these things can develop so quickly that are not comprehensible for humans. And I think it can, and it's honestly be dangerous because um, I think humans need some time to adapt to technology. We already see, <clears throat> excuse me, how things like social networks have a certain impact or smartphones. We're just not, I mean, this stuff is brand new, right? I mean, the first smartphone, it depends on how you want to find a smartphone, but the iPhone came out about 10 years ago, a little more than that. Uh, and so look at, at, look at the trajectory and the journey of like the hype cycle and then people now thinking, oh, like maybe we should step back and be careful with that. And I think machine learning is one of these things that could progress so quickly that we're not able to catch up from a mental perspective, cognitively. Uh, so it would be great to see another AI winter and get some regulations in place that at least, you know, um, most countries in the world or the Western world agrees upon doing certain things like prioritizing human needs or humans in whatever decision is being made. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I, I understand I'm venturing into some very dystopian ideas here, yeah. but I think it's, a, it's, I think it's a, at least a good conversation to be had without painting, you know, the apocalypse uh, uh, or, or predicting the, the pop apocalypse. But I just, I, li I think we should all think about that because we're at a point where we can still, you know, put things in control. For sure. My only concern about an AI winter is that that won't necessarily be the case for these large companies that have tons of hardware and tons of software and they can continue, but the everyday person can't yeah. um, to some extent. So I think that that would be pretty dangerous in some aspects. Um, but yeah, who knows? It'll be so interesting to see where this stuff goes and shakes out. Oh, totally, totally. And I'm actually not that, that pessimistic as it might sound or come across but how do you think seo should think about this whole development like what is what is something that that people should um you know start looking at and obviously the courses that we mentioned but um how should how should seo start to think about the impact of machine learning on seo so i think first and foremost we should be thinking about it in terms of this really powerful tool that will that can take over everyday boring tasks that we do. It will allow us to level up as an industry and evolve to focusing more of our time on higher level strategy, higher level thinking, and allowing machines to do some of the silly, traditional, low level SEO tasks that we know and do today. I would love that. I would love to see that yeah. happening. Yeah, it'd be so nice. Because there's still, there's still so many uh, points, as you mentioned, where you just do something really dumb. Or maybe it's just me. <laughs> maybe it's just me. me where, too. Okay, okay. Where you just do a lot of manual stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I, think, I think there's a lot to be gained. And I can't wait for more tools to, to provide some really kick-ass machine learning features. Is there anything that you can already say about Moz uh, adding some of that, uh, besides maybe the user intent thing? Yeah, Moz is working hard to innovate in that space big time um, with our whole mission really being to just provide instant insights. So instead of telling you, you know, give us your data, do this, do this, do this, do this, we want to be like, just give us, you know, the data or allow us to pull data and we will just boom, provide you insights. So we're trying to shorten that path from collecting the data to getting the insights and making it way more accurate, way more efficient, um, and then 
you know, making sure that it gets executed so that you improve. For sure. Oh, I can't wait yeah. for that to happen. Um, yeah. Is there anything else outside of machine learning that currently fascinates you that really has your interest? Ooh, such, I love this question. Um, someone asked, or Danny Dover. Oh, Do you yeah. know who Danny Dover is? SCJ, yeah. yeah. Legend. <laughs> he, we were at a birthday party recently where I got to meet him, and it was this big long table, and everyone was kind of all over the place in their conversation. <laughs> and he goes, Hey, and he goes, let's go around the table. I want everyone to say what they're interested in and how someone else could get started. Love and it. it was the most fascinating night of conversations <clears throat> ever. That is so, so much better than a typical, what do you do for a living? And like, totally. Totally. It was really, really interesting stuff. And so now I feel like I'm just repeating some of those. But That's cool. um, I asked uh, my friends at a book club recently that question. And uh, my friend Tanya recommended um, the Reply All podcast episode on the Snapchat thief. Hmm. I haven't been sleeping since I listened to that. <laughs> I mean, this stuff is crazy. That is really piqued my interest in online security uh and then what this, happened sorry to, to cut you off oh, what yeah, happened yeah, no, i need to know good. oh my god it's it talks about these hackers who hack like og handles so they wanted this handle that was just lizard on snapchat okay and so they basically are sim thieves so they will call your cell phone provider and they will tell them like, oh, I got a new phone. They will get the cell phone provider to switch access to the phone so they can get into your Snapchat that way through two-factor authentication. Yeah. And then it just, I mean, and then it gets into like doxing and swatting and like really scary shit. And the journalist investigating this was so scared that he was going to start to uncover who these hackers were and they were going to swat his house or his family. And so he met with um, this old CIA director who consulted for uh, Mr. Robot. Oh. And he told him like all the steps to take to protect his online security. And it's just, it will get your mind spinning. Wow. That is yeah. fascinating. And I've, I've recently been to uh, my first SEO Oktoberfest. Um, and there was uh, also a guy whose name I'm not going to, mentioned but um that certainly one of the top hackers in the world um and the stuff that he told me in just a short conversation was enough to get you thinking honestly like there's so much stuff out there that can happen to you so much bad stuff you read i don't want to know yeah. and it feels like that's one of these things i know it really is. So you're yeah. gonna, are you going to write a machine learning algorithm to protect people's uh, Snapchat? <laughs> How identity? cool would that be? Yeah. That, I mean, that would be amazing. Yeah, I don't know. It just got me thinking about that stuff a lot. Oh, yeah. There's, mm -hmm. there's so much room for potential. See, the problem is also that that stuff gets us thinking, but I would say we're pretty much on the cutting edge of, well, not super deep in cybersecurity, but we're techie, right? We're, yeah. we work in the tech sector. Like what the hell's my mom going to do when she's on Instagram? You know, know what I mean? Oh, I know that. Yeah. That's not fair. Uh, yeah. You need to save the world, Brittany. You need to write some, you need to, you need to write some security algorithms, honestly, because that's really bad. Um, no, another really not. interesting question that I'd like to ask besides what are you currently curious about is who do you follow or who do you look up to currently? Who are people that you, that intrigue you? Yeah. Oh, that's really good. I just recently got pretty hooked on Mel uh, Robinson, I think her name is. She is just incredible and has theories about how bullshit motivation is. And uh, you sh you're never going to feel ready to do the things that you have to do. So just count down from five and do it. Like, she's awesome. Um, I really like uh, the School of Greatness podcast with, um, I'm blanking on his name. He's an incredible uh, athlete, yeah, handball player. Oh, athlete, yeah. He's so just, I feel like you would love him. Yeah, yeah, I've been listening to his stuff. I know him, I know him. I mean, oh. I just, I'm blanking on the name Lewis as well. How. Lewis Howe. Oh, Lewis Howe, Howe. yeah, yeah, Lewis Howe. Lewis Howe's? Yeah. One of the two. Uh, he's just an incredible interviewer and has really cool people on. The episode with Robert Green is amazing. Yeah. The episode with Ryan Holiday is so good. Um, two of like my all time favorite authors for sure. Uh, yeah. I've, I've just been trying to read a lot this year as well. 
So yeah, just kind of yeah. doing lots of Audible, Kindle, but I love the books in person. I'm yeah. a big note taker and I like to highlight and underline and preach. I'm doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. It's like my my treasure. It's one of the three things I would say if my house was burning is my book collection <laughs> over there with all the notes in it, right? And all the marginalia and all that. that. Oh, for sure. Easily, honestly. Yeah. Um, oh, yes, me too. And I just recently discovered the Kindle syncing with Audible so that you can listen to a book and read it and it's going to sync that. And I'm like, oh, yes, I needed that because you can also take notes in the app. So. Oh, wait, you can like start listening to a section and it'll bring you up to speed. No yes, way. It is insane. It doesn't have that for all the books, um, but it will it will basically show you the word that are currently being um, that you can listen to and often narrated by the author. So you can follow right. along and you can take notes by marking and highlighting. You can export wow. them. All. Yeah, it's it's next level stuff. I love that. It's like, oh, it's cool. I can just listen all the time. I feel like the the, the certain topic of this conversation is learning. It's yes. machine learning. It's, it's chess. How fun is it? I like my mental and emotional well-being is always at its best when I'm learning. Yeah. It really is. Like, I feel so much better. I have to be learning. Otherwise, like, what are we here to do, you know? I'm um, the same way. All the personality tests that I did show that learning is one of my core kind of motivations, curiosity, all, like, it's all maxed up to the, uh, to the end. So, I mean, do you know why, you, why you're so much into learning? What, where that comes from? That's a good question. I think my parents put a huge emphasis on it as a kid. Both of my parents are in education, and that was a super, super big thing in our house. That was like how you got praise, you know? Yeah, and I just loved it. My mom was a stay-at-home mom and taught us how to read from a super young age, and it just she always made it fun. And she always she was I think this was the smartest thing she ever did as a parent was we could either do our chores for thirty minutes or go to our room and read. Oh. So of course we would go read. And both my brother and I just fell in love with books and reading and, yeah. Oh, it's a dream. So yeah. I feel like it's a completely rounded story now, you know. Yeah. And it's <laughs> like there's nothing to add. I don't know what else to ask. That's a, that's a perfect conversation we just had here. It's a perfect show. Oh, that was so fun. Oh, oh Brittany, thank you so much for your time. This is awesome. Before we wrap it up, um, where can people find you? Yeah, people can find me on Twitter at the handle just Brittany Muller, one T N E Y. Um, I'm not super active on LinkedIn, but you can connect with me there and send me a message, and I'll make sure to try to go through those. Uh, Brittany Muller at Gmail is probably the best email to get access, and yeah. Awesome. I appreciate the German name, by the way. Um, yeah! <laughs> go Germany! <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, they're, they're cooler cooler languages anyway uh let's not get wrapped up in that as well thank you so much for your time Brittany. you're uh an absolute rock star uh, and i can't wait to meet you in person next um but that was super insightful thank you so much for sharing oh my gosh thanks for having me you're so very welcome that was so fun i'm so excited for your, your next newsletter i learned tons of stuff from oh, you oh god you read that Yes, I oh. love it. Oh, I love you. it, Kevin. Oh, my God. It's so good. We have we have very similar tastes and stuff. It's awesome. Uh, yes, we are. I feel like we're one hundred percent brain synced. Yeah. So much. Yeah. But thank you very much. Uh, now the pressure is on. <laughs> yeah, I was try to forget how like who reads that stuff because if I think about it honestly, I'll just stop sending stuff. Right. That's awesome. Oh, though. Thank God. you so much. It's super kind. Yeah, of course.